So, uh, okay, so I, I'm going to give a uh, uh, something general on, on Chinese economy. Actually, so I, I think we need to make it more provocative uh, and debatable. Uh, and this may uh, help us uh, go deeper. Uh, uh, so in the understanding of the Chinese uh, economy and uh, of course so related to uh, economic uh, problems or issues, they are also social, political, so you name it. <clears throat> um, okay, so the topic is, uh, uh, you, you could say a bit more economics because we mentioned about the growth and, uh, and the productivity and you may say, uh, you know how to define it. Uh, this is uh, this is something uh, quite complicated, uh, but I, I'm I'm not going to get into that. Uh, as Xiaobing mentioned, so in, introduce me. Uh, I've been working uh, almost for my whole academic life so on uh, macro measurement issues. Uh, macro measurement is something like. Uh, uh, okay, so you study uh, macroeconomics in the long run. So short run, so we always chase equilibrium. Actually, we try to ignore a lot of, lot of problems, but in the long run, it's different. Uh, it is a big challenge. <clears throat> okay, so let's see uh, uh, my topic today. Uh, I start with this uh, um, picture. Uh, it sounds like uh, uh, it looks like uh, it's something uh, the media would like to make a, a something uh, attractive. So uh, China has a problem, uh, but China also a giant. Okay, so we see a giant. Now uh, it seems not very stable. Um, so it is we are we are facing the Chinese economy is facing a lot of problems. Uh, so so media. Uh, People, uh, reporters, and uh, journalists, so they, they like to make quite a big noise about uh, the China problem. So let's see, uh, I, I try to uh, use today's uh, time, uh, you know, shortly, one hour, try to go through this and see if I can answer uh, some of the questions uh, in your mind and also may, maybe also in my mind. So uh, I, I see those problems as important problems. So I start with this. So China is sick. Uh, actually, so any economy uh, you know, can, uh, can have any sort of problems or disease. So, but it is sick of its own growth model. And we're going to, uh, to see what is uh, uh, the China model of growth. So why it uh, actually uh, inherent uh, sort of uh, uh, has um, uh, problems uh, from, from that model. And can we, uh, uh, how can China, you know, sort of uh, uh, solve the problems or uh, work out of that kind of shadow? So let's see. Okay, <clears throat> observations. And this is uh, just to first answer my question. Okay, so this is maybe easier. Uh, okay, slow down. Growth slow down. Uh, let's look at the growth slow down. So this uh, uh, curve is actually uh, basically for the last uh, uh, quarter of the century. So 25 years also. Uh, I think this is long enough for for, we, for us to understand the current problem. Um, we use official data for uh, GDP estimates. Uh, some people may say, oh, there are a lot of controversials. Okay, so let's start with this kind of controversial. Um, so this is official data and using official approach, which is not so transparent. If you ask me what exactly official approach is, I can give you my guess. And some people t uh, may say, okay, my guess could be quite close because I have been working on uh, have been working on this for a long time, but I I, I don't know. This is still something not very uh, transparent. But anyway, so this is what we see. If you follow this uh, trend, this is a polynomial trend. 
And so we can see that there are sometimes so the good time, right? So the economy is really uh, go up swing uh, above the trend uh, with the strength, but then so that is not uh, you know uh, uh, for a long time. So and, and then we can see the other times. And then the last period uh, shadowed, so that's COVID. So, uh, and then you can tell, so if the current problem, if we see the problems now, uh, is it due to COVID or not? I, I think you can tell. So we'll come back to that, right? So if you follow the trend, you would say, no, 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 it's not COVID, all right? Um, we have alternative estimates. Uh, exactly using the same official data. But we follow the standard approach to deal with this kind of GDP data. We start from GDP nominal, and then we build up, using our, you use official data, we build up a, a price matrix, and we put everything we see in the system and to, uh, to do our deflation and aggregation. Um, with the same data, we don't have official growth rate. For these 25 years, officially 8.2, and we can get a 7.2. This is for, from uh, a, a research group uh, uh, I lead, this kind of a group. So the green line gave you this. And then so someone may have heard. So this is uh, uh, medicine and the eye. Uh, we, we started working on this a long time. So in mid of the 90s, uh, back to Groningen time, so but there, uh, and we we uh, we try our approach. We call this the physical indicator based alternative estimates. Um, okay, so this is what you can see. Sometimes we have even faster growth now official, um, but certainly um, you know before this period, uh, so you see a more or less the same pattern, but certainly a, a kind of a different. Um, magnitude. Um, but after that, sometimes we have things opposite, right? Uh, I also cannot tell you, uh, get into this, why you sometimes you have a very odd opposite pattern. But my question would be uh, why it shouldn't be opposite? Because, you know, we don't know how official eventually uh, constructed this. Anyway, this is the growth. But basically, I try to uh, convey this message. You see this trend, and you see all uh, different estimates uh, from official to alternative, but uh, the decline is sure, right? If you look at medicine, if you look at the medicine, you can see that it's kind of one period, a couple of years before. So, yeah. It's not yeah. simple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can. Okay, so if you, uh, you have econometrics in mind, so if you think about this kind of uh, uh, different timing, right? So you, you could say that. Uh, and you may further ask uh, why you use physical indicators like uh, major commodities, like uh, numbers employed. So why this will show something different from the value? You know, sometimes the value you give you opposite. All right, okay. Um, okay, so far we've done growth. We say growth slows down, and quite substantially. And, and now we see a productivity. I just, I, I, I try to use a one chart. Uh, this is a very summary <coughs> uh, chart, because, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the previous, uh, weeks, so I, I did uh, several very intensive productivity uh, seminars. So this is a very uh, simple and, and it's a, a kind of a summary. Uh, only for the recent uh, uh, four sub-periods, still that, basically that 25 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so on this one, we divided Actually, we, we try to, uh, 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 to account for the sources of aggreg aggregate growth. So the height is aggregate growth, uh, period average from the previous one, the green line, not Madison Wu, 
the green line, still using official data. And why? Because all behind uh, industry level data, and uh, if you try to make an alternative, you cannot work uh, <clears throat> on uh, uh, much less information. So uh, like, uh, like the uh, major in, uh, physical indicators, you have to go back to official input output uh, system. So, uh, and then that's why. Okay. <clears throat> so this one's source of aggregate growth um, for productivity. This is my focus here. So you pick up this gray color. Okay. So and this is the period uh, is actually uh, following Deng Xiaoping's second push for what he called border reform. You know, uh, this is from mid nineties. And China introduced the SOE, state-owned enterprises reform, in that period. Um, but that is not a complete SOE reform. The reform is featured, what the Chinese say, xiao. That is, so you grab the big, you save the big, and then you liberalize the small. You liberalize the, uh, liberalize the small to save money, and, you, and, and then you can support the big. So all the big Chinese firms, even now you see overseas, they emerge from that kind of reform. So that reform is not a genuine kind of a market reform. It is a government strategy and to, is kind of, a, you know, to, to use SOEs in the market environment, right? Okay, we can say that, so that, that period. And then, so this one, you know, any time from any perspective you show the growth, and for this period, this is WTO. So WTO to the Chinese economy is really a gift in the sense that actually before this period, uh, with the fast growth in the 90s, China built up a huge surplus capacity, just like now. This is the second time uh, following global financial crisis. So back to that time, so China also built up a huge capacity and, you know, uh, China worked very hard and pushed the U.S. very hard to get into WTO. So uh, in the final stage of the negotiation, the Premier Zhu, Zhu Rongji, actually was um, uh, actually making, uh, made a lot of compromises in order to get into it. The State Council team, his team actually eventually got angry uh, and you know, keep talking to him. So even in the meeting under the table, uh, the notes to tell him, no, 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 you're too far. You, you're far away from what we have agreed. So this is going to be a big trouble. And uh, so do the premier do ask him to stop, to shut up. And he made a lot of compromises. Um, but then so China entered WTO. So that is a huge benefit for Chinese economy, but also not very long. So you can see that for a huge economy like China, only uh, six or seven years, that kind of condition can lift the economy like this. That giant you see at the beginning, so really emerged from this period. Uh, okay, and prepare preparation and this period, and then this following uh, uh, financial uh, the global financial crisis. Uh, here you okay. So the height gave you growth, right? If you make a hundred percent. What do you see? You see the, uh, the dark blue, uh, you know, going to be more and more. Uh, and uh, up to this period, almost all dark blue, which means even you maintain a much s slower growth, you need capital. You need investment. So the investment become less and less inefficient, right? So this is very clear. All right. So. Uh, um, the very important message here, uh, China, you know, for the past 10 years before COVID, already lost productivity. Loss of produ productivity for 10 years is something quite serious. Um, so you, as an economist, you, 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 you will ask, you, okay, so, so what's the incentives for investment? Who did the investment if you, you know, uh, have such a long, long period of a negative uh, productivity, which means so uh, uh, with the same unit of inputs, labor and capital, you get less and less. Okay, so this is another perspective. 
Um, many people would like to say, okay, well, I want to see a labor productivity, which means the, uh, actually you want to see output per, per labor out here. It must be a, 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 a constant quality unit per hour. You have to do that. Do that. Um, so since I mentioned this, I can tell you, if you work on labor, uh, so you cannot only work on numbers employed, because you have to pay attention to the hour intensity. <clears throat> Back to this period, the hour intensity can be very high. For some industries, increase from 1 to 1.4, 1.5. So one labor becomes one and a half. So if you ignore this, your measurement of input will be wrong. Okay, so uh, for, you know, for this chart, you can remove the hours, okay? Uh, and this kind of, uh, you know, sky blue, you remove hours, and, and the other height, you can remeasure, you get the uh, labor productivity growth. So that can be uh, decomposed into capital deepening. Um, you know, maybe many people uh, uh, know this, capital deepening, which means uh, you know, per, per hour here, or per labor, unit of labor, you know, how much capital you have, capital stock, and then the so labor quality. And the residue, still, TFP grows. So uh, the same, so uh, you, you can see the picture, uh, these two in parallel. Okay, so this tells us productivity uh, declines for the past 10 years. So with the growth declines, so certainly this is not very good news, right? Okay, so um, uh, next one, okay, how is China compared with other economies? Uh, we use something, uh, firstly, uh, I, I try to put the China back to the, uh, to the so-called East Asia model. Uh, maybe some people have been working on that model. So East Asia model basically, um, um, you know, covered in the past, uh, typically Japan, South Korea, and uh, Taiwan. So Japan actually uh, started from this period. So we should ignore the first line. Okay, so let's concentrate on uh, the income from PBP 2000 and double that to 4000 and then again double it. There's two income doubling and we use the measure is Angus Madison's 1990 uh, PPP uh, uh, price, PPP uh, uh, dollar uh, in 1990 price. Um, so for these two periods, actually, basically, it is a very important period for you to finish economic takeoff. So you finish the takeoff, and so you know something like uh, your, 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 your airplane is leveled. So, so uh, it's not yet really into the, uh, the, the cruise level, but, but certainly the most difficult part you finished. Uh, okay, so we see China by this time. So exactly what I mentioned, uh, this is now actually. Uh, so if you ignore the COVID, so we, we go back to COVID. So the, by this time, so this is what China finished. Uh, you know, PPP, $8,000. So equivalent to the Japanese in 1968, you know, some people have a slightly different measure, they say 1970, that's fine. So uh, basically you have one doubling, something like uh, from seven to 10 years. Uh, it's already very fast growth uh, for any economy. And then this is Korea, this is Taiwan. So you can tell to finish this green framed period, uh, you know, roughly 15 years, nearly 15 years, uh, 16 years, uh, and no, 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 I'm sorry. So 20 years, 20 years, 19 years, and 23 years. So China actually was a bit slower. Um, so, all right, so um, to see here, th this is a kind of uh, uh, a, um, Projection. So, uh, assuming that no COVID shock, and assuming China would follow uh, Japanese growth rate. So, this is what we can see. Maybe uh, by 2028, uh, if everything's okay, and then so China could finish uh, 12,000. 
if you convert 12,000 to the current dollars, US dollars, so China by that time is actually become a high income country. Uh, so if that uh, is materialized by this prediction, so China's of course going to be an even bigger giant economy. Uh, all right, so um, I, I use this one, so don't worry if you cannot read the details. I, I try to show you that, so if you just control, uh, don't control the, the uh, stage of development. So that one is uh, actually, uh, so you, you can tell that, so they, they are all different time, right? We control the stage of development. And this one is the same time. Um, anyway, so you, you can, if, if you like, you can work into this, so why you, 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 you allow them to be compared in the same time. But anyway, so uh, let's see. Uh, so um, for this period already, China was the best, uh, one of the best, not, not that. So, uh, so Russia uh, was better in terms of productivity. I don't know if it's due to uh, uh, oil prices or anything, uh, but the price effect should be removed. Uh, I have no idea here maybe BART, and uh, India, uh, same as China, uh, and you, you know, on average, this BRIC economy is uh, actually uh, very close to China, so back to that period. And if you move to this one before COVID, for this period, so uh, China was not that superior to many other economies, so you can, you can, you can pick up here, China's negative, uh, of course, this is a group, this is G7, right? Uh, without Japan, so <clears throat> also negative, um, but here is not, right? So uh, the East Asia without China is not. Um, what I mean here is, so um, put China in a kind of international comparison, you're back to the, uh, the East Asia model, or currently, and uh, certainly uh, for the last decade, uh, the perform China, Chinese performance actually is indeed kind of a declining. Um, okay, so this one, if you would like to rate, so you should uh, rate you know, uh, 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 with connection to the uh, stage, because I control the stages. I try to show that, um, okay, I try to show that you know, so if we use official data, uh, what kind of results? Uh, and basically, uh, so the, this the, uh, uh, if we see the uh, very last uh, uh, decade or 12 years, you know, from the end point, so the, this is the Chinese performance, uh, if we use alternative data to estimate, it's negative TFP. This is the contribution, you make 100, right? Uh, but if you use the, uh, the green line, remember, at the beginning, so that, that is based on uh, standard theory and the approach, you still get negative, but you use official data directly. This is the uh, conference board, uh, uh, you, know, you know, official, uh, that kind of uh, 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 version, so I uh, gave you this one, it's quite in line with the previous, uh, the, the, the other three economies, but you know the capital and the labor share are very different, right? That that's something will cause a lot of uh, uh, discussion. Okay, implications. So China's uh, growth slowdown took place in the wake of a global financial crisis. So um, you know up to COVID, that should be something like ten years and has nothing to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. China's performance does not appear to be in line with the, uh, its stage of development. And the productivity deterioration uh, looks more worrisome than the growth slowdown. So if you remember the, uh, the early chart uh, table, so uh, growth more or less the same. So, um, so you're bound to be um, sort of uh, slowing down uh, when you get into that stage, even the Japanese also slow down. Okay, um, so what is the reason? Okay, 
uh, well, we search for that. I have some several charts to help you. Uh, so the, the next few, uh, maybe two, is about the rising unit labor cost. Uh, and then while consumption remaining abnormally low. Okay, for this one, uh, I don't know uh, if any of you uh, has this kind of uh, knowledge in mind. So if you compare um, nominal compensation per labor, that's your cost, nominal, right? So you have to use nominal. You compare that to the real GDP. Uh, no, 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 the, 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 okay, so the, the, the real uh, uh, output per labor, that's a kind of a real labor productivity. Uh, that, that is saying that, so to produce a one real unit of output, the, the real terms, unit of output, and how much nominal pay, you pay, you pay your labor. Um, so this is still the same for periods, so you see this WTO period. And actually many people will raise questions for this. For what kind of forces you can make the economy suddenly reduce cost like this? Um, people even say that you know, previously you, you're still having this, you know, particularly for manufacturing. These the four or five groups in the middle, manufacturing. Um, one reason could be it's already uh, you know, uh, a surplus capacity and the demand for labor is weak. Uh, but certainly, if you focus on this, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, decrease in unit labor cost means that you increase your competitiveness. Uh, so you become more competitive in the international market. Uh, so this is the, that period, what you can see, and with the financial, uh, with the global financial crisis, you see this jump. And the simple message here is uh, in, in China's heyday, WTO. So this is uh, something, uh, you know, uh, really to uh, raise China's competitiveness. Is Chinese, pr you know, produced uh, is much cheaper. So I remember back to those times, so even countries actually much richer than China by then, like Thailand and Malaysia. So uh, the yield, so um, you, you know, uh, we, we were driven out by unfair competition. Um, so, so here, this is in national currency, right? So it's not, this is domestic competitiveness, it's not international competitiveness. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. So uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we, we do have that, so uh, we, we need some more work, actually. Uh, I work with the conference board team in China, in China Center. So this doesn't necessarily on No, 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 you, you, okay, right. Uh, right. Um, but the currency back to then is quite uh, stable. Um, uh, but, okay, the currency effect, the D um okay, uh, the deflation effect actually uh, introduced the, from the early 90s. So China suddenly uh, uh, actually uh, devalued uh, the renminbi, the currency. And back to this time, supposed to be quite stable. But anyway, so uh, this is the cost. So in 2005, they actually introduced uh, floating. Uh, uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, 2005 is kind of, uh, uh, yeah. Before it was fixed. Uh, yeah, before the pegging and then floating, right. Okay. All right, so this one. Um, this one in nominal terms. So I try to show you uh, abnormally low final consumption share. Uh, this is in uh, PPP GDP. In, this is nominal terms. So uh, like, uh, you know, current year, how much money. Um, actually, we say how much uh, income per capita. Uh, and what share uh, is used for final consumption. Um, actually, for any economy, after you have, you, 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 you have grown for such a long time, so income uh, increased, uh, and then the, uh, uh, you, you, you will no longer have a cost advantage, and the domestic market is very important. But China is certainly missing that. So, so if you uh, 
uh, if you go, uh, if you try to Google this, there are a lot of discussions. So certainly this is something uh, really uh, atypical. Uh, so the, uh, the dark blue one is middle income average. And the green one is India. So, and, and the red one is China. So you can compare. Uh, Vietnam is the, uh, this kind of uh, yellow. Uh, and the US is the, uh, uh, the sky blue. So this is the, uh, this one. OK. Uh, implications. So China is now facing a key challenge to any economy. Uh, I try to make it general. So uh, a key challenge to any economy that has experienced a rapid income growth for at least 20 decades. Uh, sorry, <laughs> 20 years. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 20 decades, right? <laughs> So like the East Asia and other European economies post-war, so that is whether uh, its productivity growth can timely overcome the rise of labor cost. So this is the key issue, right? So uh, you have to uh, have that kind of uh, strength of uh, productivity drive to overcome the rise of labor cost. However, the productivity growth at this crossroad will no longer uh, uh, rely on technological imitation, but innovation. So that is a genuine uh, and sustainable innovations can really drive your future growth. So the rising labor cost also means that China is losing its competitiveness uh, in the international market. This is not accurate, as Bart mentioned. Sure. And therefore, its domestic market is essential to sustain the growth. OK. Um, there has been a lot of discussions about uh, China and Japan. So uh, uh, I heard people even call it, uh, if China now is having the Japanese disease. Um, all right, so let, let's try to go through this. So, um, so the, let's see uh, um, um, sort of uh, similarities and differences. Uh, I try to emphasize the, uh, uh, the differences, but there are also similarities uh, for quite a, a long period. So, so uh, the ideas for similarities uh, actually um, promoted by uh, several international banks. Uh, and this guy, uh, Nomura guy, Richard Koo, and so they draw um, parallels um, between China and Japan. Um, uh, particularly China now and uh, with Japan in the 90s, uh, they say China is facing a similar, the Japanese 3D challenge, that is debt, demographics, and the deflation. Uh, and, uh, and then because of the problems, so uh, the, the, uh, the companies and the households, they are fixing their balance sheet recession. Um, so they are not uh, really active in production. Um, some people do not agree. They say the Japanese firms, companies, they are very active overseas. But, but the, for the domestic problem, so the government has to fill the gap. So this is, how, this is the game, uh, they, they say that the Japanese one. Um, but then so, uh, uh, we could argue that China actually is different. So how, 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 how could we say China is having a Japanese disease? So China has a distinctly different institutional model of growth so that indulgently uh, engineers rapid growth regardless efficiency, driven by comp competitions between local governments motivated by highly uh, politicized growth targets. So they make uh, the growth targets political. So that's something uh, quite unique. Uh, for the Chinese uh, model uh, in the past uh, maybe 25 or 30 years. Okay, so let's see. Uh, uh, those charts are not big enough, I'm sorry. Because I cut them from, from uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, and then I try to work on this. Um, if you like it, so uh, you ask Xiaobing, so you, you, you can have it. Okay, the first one is China's debt, uh, debt challenge. Uh, so l let's see, uh, and the, uh, I, I put these slopes. Uh, you see how amazingly 
the slopes actually are, are the same. Uh, so no matter what, so when, after you have a shock, and then so you can get back. You get back the, with the same capacity of the previous loans, whatever you build up that there, rather than the market will redirect you. And to me, this is, can be quite amazing. Um, okay, so I put it here, right? Um, all right, let's see uh, from here to here. This is leverage and the deleverage and the leverage again and the deleverage. Um, but here we see that, so even you with a strong leverage push, uh, actually uh, the deflation become a more problematic, right? Uh, so this is the zero line. Um, and so uh, the, um, the, what we can see, the deflation actually is very much to do with the uh, surplus capacity. Okay, and now we, let's see uh, companies began to quickly build up their debts uh, over this, this period I indicated, and so did uh, households over uh, 2016 and 20. Uh, it is, however, uh, so impossible to continue after uh, 2020. This is what we can see from, uh, uh, from the chart. Um, Okay, so that's households. So um, down this one, the number four uh, exhibition here is, uh, so they are uh, the uh, population changes um, um, measured particularly by age dependency ratio. Uh, so China is still that, not that old, right? So if you, this blue line, the slightly light blue line is China, and the dark blue is the Euro area, and yellow is Japan, and the dots are, uh, is US. Um, so if we compare China uh, and Japan, so remember what we, what, what we did in that table. So China is now, 2000 something like 2018, 8,000 PPP, and the Japanese, uh, by the time of the bubble burst, Japanese already doubled that one. So China and, uh, and Japan, so, uh, so they are not on the same footing. Okay, all right. Um, if you say so, if you compare the dependence uh, um, ratio, so certainly, uh, so because by this time, so China is still half of Japanese <laughs> Uh, per capita income, so China has a premature aging, and this is a challenge. Okay, uh, now we see the housing problem. So this is one of the major problems currently. Uh, I use this chart. This is a chart I think by Richard Ku, Nomura uh, Research. Okay, so uh, now you see, before I add more things, you see uh, this is a full actually lines, uh, the purple and the green, so they are Japanese housing uh, index price. So one is the Tokyo area, the purple, and the green one is the Kyoto, Osaka area. And these two um, blue lines, one is darker, one is lighter, so uh, one is the existing Beijing house price, and this one is Beijing new housing price. Um, actually, so we cannot, with this chart, we cannot exactly control the time. But uh, when Richard Kuh made this one, uh, he had this sense in his mind. So you see these two time axes, they are different, right? Um, okay, so if you try to match what the China now, okay, so the, we should go back to at least 1970 you know, before the oil crisis starts. So according to the previous table, right? Okay, so let's frame uh, these two lines, the Japanese one, okay? So let's uh, introduce the slope, the two slopes. My purpose is to compare, and this is the Chinese one, 
okay, um, the two points here is the, the, uh, the authorities introduced controls. That's what I said, uh, this particular China model uh, uh, of the economy is, you know, uh, sometimes the government actually uh, stepped in to try to uh, um, change the market, right? Okay, so, right? So, if you know this kind of, uh, you know, this one, if you ignore the shock, you make a curve this way, and oh, you, you, uh, you know, for the two uh, different curves, you can compare the two, actually they are quite close, right? Uh, this is what I mean here. Uh, so you have to, if you want to try, try, try to, com uh, to compare, so you have to compare to the much early time. Uh, all right, so the uh, 40 years uh, earlier, right? Okay. Uh, another issue is the infrastructure. Uh, China is now having a, um, okay, China is having a wonderful infrastructure development so far. So if you had that kind of experience, airports and railways, you know, these high speed railways. Um, but now so we see that uh, not in every province, but certainly in a lot of provinces, you see half the airports have no service at all. Uh, and there are uh, high speed train stations empty uh, since they were built. Okay, so Richard Ku is also from Nomula, and he has a point. He said, so China is very dangerous now uh, compared to the Japanese, uh, um, when the Japanese bubble uh, burst. So this is China now, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, uh, he used a, a particular indicator to compare uh, the, uh, the construction gross output compared to the final demand, that's the GDP, and to build up this kind of a curve. Um, so let's see, all right. So if you try to compare Japan, you should go back to this period. So 1970, right? Remember that? And this is, this is the Chinese, you know, these are two benchmarks, so they are actually comparable. Um, so this is the Japanese bubble burst at PPP 16,000, so this particular time. So after the bubble burst, you see the decline like this. This is construction, right? Um, they're not the case of China, right? So, uh, so if you draw this line to see uh, uh, if you back to the early time, so certainly the Chinese economy is more construction driven, right? So this can t clearly tell us that kind of uh, uh, situation. Uh, so you put a lot of resources to sustain the growth, actually they end up uh, in uh, infrastructure. Okay, so this one is about the population. Anyone can stop me? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the China's um, demographic crisis is more uh, prominent if considering the stage of development. And this has been something uh, quite confusing. And many people compare China now with the Japanese uh, um, at the moment, or some people uh, with, with a bit earlier time, but uh, you know, ignoring the uh, the stage of development. So the the red 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 curve is China curve, and this is the Chinese stage of development so far. You know, up to this point, and the Japanese is blue, right? So here, back to 1970, uh, roughly. All right, so let's have the slope to kiss the curve. Uh, okay, at this point, the Japanese population growth was faster than China's. So you see this one, uh, okay. And unlike China, Japan only faces a demographic turning point uh, four decades later. So from here to here. This is what Japanese, the Japanese journey like this. Uh, not the China one. So you see the China's slope, and okay, so you see, uh, and this is actually a, 
for Japanese, I could say roughly this is more income effect. And for, for the Chinese one, it's a one child policy effect. You had one child policy to actually uh, to have a, uh, to raise, artificially raise savings. Uh, that's the purpose. Okay. Uh, but it's a double sword, double edged sword, right? So you, uh, you, you reduce population uh, on one hand, but then you will have an early aging uh, on the other hand. Okay. Okay, so implications at the same stage of development, China relied heavily on uh, leveraged debt uh, driven investment compared to Japan at the same stage. The peers that the China's growth relied more on engineered uh, by the government, uh, the growth engineered by the government, it caused a rapid growth of uh, infrastructure construction and the residential housing development. But this also caused a huge surplus capacity. And because of building up this, um, so you can imagine why China is so keen to have this uh, one belt, one road initiative. Because uh, to, ex to, to export the capacity. Um, okay, so unintentionally uh, and inevitably, however, this uh, co uh, coincidence, uh, China's um, fast and uh, immature aging, that's what caused by the government's one child policy imposed in the beginning of the 1980s, uh, intended to artificially raise savings. Okay, um, can I have time to finish this part? Uh, this part is very important, but I have to leave right, okay. All right, okay, and the China model of growth, uh, there has been a debate. Um, some people say there's no, no China model of growth. Uh, growth uh, will only rely on uh, one model. You, you want to grow, you rely on the market model. Uh, this, uh, like uh, Zhang Weiying, like uh, Huang Yasheng uh, uh, from MIT, uh, Weiying from uh, Peking U is my colleague. Uh, and, uh, and the other idea is uh, China's growth comes from the right policy. That's from Justin Lin, Lin Yifu, right? Um, okay, what do we need actually? We need a model. Uh, that can consistently answer uh, the questions. So uh, it's growth and also can also answer ethic declines. So can we do that? I don't know, we try. Okay, the nature of the China model, if we do need a definition for the model, so that should be in economics, I try, under the market condition that is open in principle and the government affect uh, affects resource allocation through, uh, okay, so rules or hidden rules. Also oh, that are usually uh, not legally uh, expressible according to its own objective function. And the problems in the economy, that is the nature or degree of a certain disequilibrium or non-ideal state to the government are judged based on the dual indicators of politics and the market and then administrative power is used to influence the market clearing, uh, okay, to impede or promote. So they can do both, right? Um, the government objective is inevitably a high growth, which uh, politicizes growth and leads to uh, growth competition among local governments. So government, uh, you know, competes actually that lead. Uh, uh, you know, private firms. So this is something uh, people like uh, uh, Wei Ying Zhang uh, doesn't really like, and he said, okay, so it seems that, uh, you know, government plays a, a quite a positive role. Uh, no, 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 I do not mean that. Okay, so let's see. So when a growth objective is made political, reform will unavoidably become opportunistic and have give its way to the growth. So anything, so uh, if you try to, uh, if anything that may affect, may challenge growth, so uh, you, you, have to, you have to be 
uh, cautious, and then you have to give uh, the growth is the uh, the top priority, um, and then all the other reforms you know become sort of opportunistic and temporary, and this is the problem, and then the problem may accumulate this way. However, the government may solve the growth problem, but it cannot solve the efficiency problem. Okay, uh, it can mobilize the resources and the lower uh, factor costs, but this means that uh, it must intervene or even participate in resource allocation and thereby changing the rules of the game, hence distorting behavior of investors, producers, which will inevitably reduce efficiency. So the model, therefore, inherently has its efficiency constraints that will eventually restrict to stop or stop growth. This is the efficiency paradox of the China model of growth. So I, I would argue this way. Okay. Almost done. So um, please prepare your questions. <laughs> the model has also two market constraints. Uh, to me, this is very important. Very maybe uh, um, at the moment. So if you want to have a uh, a quick solution. So, and first one is a long surprise, uh, 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 surprised is long surprised labor compensation uh, has limited uh, the development of the domestic market. Um, so this is very crucial uh, if you really want to get China out of the trouble at the moment, right? And even temporarily, okay. And then the other one is a political pursuit for. Uh, uh, sustainable high growth by lowering factor costs, including labor, uh, you know, a lot of things, resources, you know, water, energy, and the environment. So uh, the government try very hard by lowering those costs, and that requires an ever-expanding external market. I think this is a very important message. Uh, so I think this should come to, uh, you know, a lot of international negotiation tables. So you have to understand the why. You have to understand the what the strength behind this. So uh, China needs external market, uh, which does not exist without a high geopolitical costs. Okay, so uh, I, I try to uh, um, you know make this more conceptual. So this is only uh, the model is a, is I call it a cross subsidization. Uh, I, I started quite a, quite a while ago, uh, you know, 10 years. Um, okay, so this one is basically a focus on, uh, only on the industrial sector. So I divided them into two parts, three parts. This is the top one, uh, the upstream, energy. Uh, and then, so this one is the intermediate materials. Uh, and then this is the, the final one, uh, semi-finished and finished. So this one is the closest to the end market. Uh, you could say that it may not be finished. It goes to other countries, but still to the Chinese is the end market. So, um, and this one actually, so they receive uh, the interventions and the subsidies, they are more indirect. So they are, they, they tend to be more efficient. And compared to the other parts, they are not. So this uh, could be less efficient compared to the final one. And uh, you know this one, so e even more uh, actually uh, inefficient. This one, and then so, okay, this is that. You know the income is the uh, the light blue, and this one is the uh, the biggest uh, income earner. So they generate the resources and to pay tax, and this one receive uh, most heavily the subsidies. Right, subsidies also go to indirect ways. You you can work out this way. Right, um, and we also have an environment that's this kind of a dash line. You see this oval, the dash gray oval. I indicate, you know, from these two big arrows here, uh, there's no, no intention to put uh, which one is up, which one down. It's the environment, right? So they are unpaid land, unpaid cost, underpaid cost of land, uh, environment, uh, labor, capital. So you, 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 can, you, you can imagine, so. Okay, this is the, uh, this is the problem. Um, okay, 
Uh, finally, I think China has a distinctly different institutional model of growth that endogenously engineers rapid growth, regardless of efficiency driven by competitions between local governments motivated by highly uh, politicized growth targets. The so induced state interventions in the form of uh, project controls, loan allocations, and the subsidies uh, financed by state-owned land have caused the severe resource misallocation, uh, overcapacity, property bubble, and the income inequality. Uh, I, I have no time to show uh, you know, my, my measure of the, uh, the resource misallocation. Uh, and the unpaid, underpaid cost of labor, among other factors, have also resulted in weak demand, I just mentioned. Therefore, the, uh, in the lack of uh, unlimited external market implicitly assumed by the China model, um, so the growth has inevitably slowed down. All right? So the last question, very simple. Can China rise to these challenges? OK, reform or not to reform? A genuine reform will face a typical reform paradox uh, in this kind of uh, political regime. So that certainly uh, challenges the reformer himself. Uh, and China's gradualist reform model, uh, as what is labeled opposed to the Soviet's uh, shock therapy or Big Bang, Big Bang uh, is opportunistic. It has repeatedly caused the government's pol uh, policy dilemmas. It inevitably makes the reform policies tend to avoid the important uh, institutional problems in areas that may challenge the system uh, or the regime. So as a result, more and more problems will accumulate and the government uh, intervention will be increasingly encouraged or invited which is contrary to the original intention of the reform. Uh, so any shorter run, less risky solution just raise the domestic demand, consumption. So thank you very much.